good evening, or at least it's evening where I am. I don't know when you'll be watching this, but we're going to try recording uh, a Wednesday night youth lesson. I figured if Tony could do it, surely I could figure it out. But anyway, Tony's probably a lot better at it than I am, but we're going to give it a try. Um, if you recall, the last time we met, it's been a while, but we talked quite a bit about the fall of Jerusalem and the beginning of what's known in the Bible as the exile. So... Jerusalem fell to Babylon in 586 BC. But before, right before that, a few years before that, uh, in starting in 605 BC, there was a first group of exiles to Babylon, people that were taken back to Babylon. And the question is, who was Daniel? Now, if you have been uh, listening to Brother Ford's sermons for the past two weeks remotely and even a few weeks before that you know who Daniel was. Daniel and his friends were some of the um, elite young men who were taken in the first group of exiles. So we think that was in about 605 BC and again that was before Babylon was ultimately destroyed by Jerusalem in 586 BC. Last time we met, we talked about how complete the destruction of Jerusalem was, and it was really, really bad. Uh, the Babylonians, led by Nebuchadnezzar, did some really mean things to the people who were still in Jerusalem. They killed a lot of people. They were very mean to the king, and they killed the king's sons. Um, they destroyed the wall around Jerusalem. They destroyed the temple in Jerusalem, and they and they stole everything that was in it. Um, so it was really a hard time for the Jews. And it was really something that I don't know how we could really even relate. I know that we're going through some unusual and hard times now uh, with this virus, but it's nothing like knowing that your nation, the only nation that serves the God that, that you know, but this nation being destroyed by somebody who serves other fake gods. But it happened, we talked last week, it happened because God judged the Israelites. And ultimately they deserved it. Um, and that was God's determination. And that was a really tough thing. He only did it after he had sent many, many prophets and given them a lot of time to turn around. But unfortunately they didn't. And they were judged similar to how God had judged many other nations and how he continues to. So we're going to talk a little bit more about Daniel. Um, Nebuchadnezzar's grandson uh, was named Belshazzar. After Nebuchadnezzar died, his son, whose name was, history tells us, his son's name was Nabonidus. That's probably not how you actually pronounce it, but we're going to give it a try. Um, but Nabonidus was the king after Nebuchadnezzar and he didn't really care much for ruling. He didn't, he didn't like it. He didn't really even want to stay in Babylon. And he left and went to kind of a faraway city in the empire. And he left ruling to his son, Nebuchadnezzar's grandson, whose name was Belshazzar. Now the Bible doesn't really talk about Nabonidus, but it does talk about Belshazzar. And the first part we're going to start reading is actually what Brother Ford's... Um, message was about this Sunday, uh, Daniel chapter 5. So the first thing we're going to read is verse 1 and 2, and then we're going to skip over and read verse 5 through 7 in Daniel chapter 5. Uh, I'll go ahead and read this, but if you are watching this, you have a Bible, I think you ought to turn to it and follow along. Uh, verse 1 and 2 of chapter 5. So Belshazzar the king made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in the presence of the thousand. While he tasted the wine, Belshazzar gave the command to bring the gold and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the temple which had been in Jerusalem, that the king and his lords, his wives, and his concubines might drink from them. Okay, now we're going to go skip to verse 5, read 5 through 7. In the same hour, the fingers of a man's hand appeared and wrote opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Then the king's countenance changed, and his thoughts troubled him, so that the joints of his hips were loosened, and his knees knocked against each other. 
the king cried aloud to bring in the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers. The king spoke, saying to the wise men of Babylon, Whoever reads this writing and tells me its interpretation shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around his neck, and he shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Now, of course, the third ruler was because technically his dad was the ruler. Um, so that's that's why he was trying to give those things away. But ultimately, Daniel was not involved in this. And as Brother Ford has, has talked many times, Daniel was set apart from the ruling class. Although he was around, he wasn't involved in things like this. He wasn't even there. Um, so the question is, what happened with this event? We, we know what Belshazzar was doing. Was Belshazzar idea a good idea? Obviously God didn't think so. So maybe the people were enjoying themselves, and they probably were. But clearly God did not find it to be a good thing to use the gold and the vessels that the Babylonians had stolen from God's temple. Um, they had been made probably back during David or Solomon's time. They were in the temple when it was destroyed and Babylonians had stolen them and they had obviously set them aside. Somebody knew what they were. Belshazzar decided to drink from them and clearly God did not think that was a good idea. So there was handwriting on the wall and again from Brother Ford's message uh, we find out and from reading in Daniel 5 that no one could read the writing. Nobody knew what it meant. And uh, Brother Ford mentioned that... Um, that the queen mother in verse 10 had the idea that there is a guy that probably could do this and his name's Daniel. We think maybe this was Belshazzar's mom and that's why the uh, that's why it refers to her as the queen mother in some translations. But we're going to read more in chapter 5 uh, skipping down to verse 22, 22 through 31. So Daniel was brought in front of them, and verse 13 through 21 talks a lot about Daniel um, telling the truth to Belshazzar. And we'll, we'll start in verse 22, and he says, But you, his son Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, although you knew all this, and you have lifted yourself up against the Lord of heaven. They have brought the vessels of his house before you, and you and your lords, your wives, and your concubines have drunk wine from them. And you have praised the gods of silver and gold, bronze and iron, wood and stone, which do not see or hear or know. And the God who holds your breath in his hand and owns all your ways you have not glorified. Then the fingers of the hand were sent from him, and this writing was written. And this is the inscription that was written, Mene, Mene, Tekel, Aperson. This is the interpretation of each word, Mene, God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Then Belshazzar gave the command and they clothed Daniel with purple and put a chain of gold around his neck and made a proclamation concerning them that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. But that very night, Belshazzar, king of the Chaldeans, was slain, and Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. So what we see here is that Belshazzar really did not rule for very long. He technically wasn't even the main ruler, but he was in control when this happened. And you know, you need to go back over this and think about what these words meant. And again, I, I keep saying this, but Brother Ford talked about this a lot in the sermon this weekend, that God says that he had weighed Belshazzar, God had weighed Belshazzar in the balances and found him wanting. And what a terrible thing to think uh, of God thinking of us, looking at our lives and saying, you haven't lived up to what you could have. And that's something that we all need to strive to not be like Belshazzar. Belshazzar put himself in front of God and that was that was significantly worse than what God expected from him. So when God said that um, that um, he had numbered the kingdom and finished it, 
he actually meant he finished it that very night. And history tells us specifically that this was October 12th of 539 B.C. And it was around 70 years after the first group of exiles, including Daniel, were brought from Jerusalem in 605 B.C. So Daniel had prophesied, and others had too, that this exile would last around 70 years. And that is almost exactly what happened. So Okay, so slide two. We're going to start talking about Persia. So I'm sure that in your history classes you have learned of Persia. Persia was the next great world power after Babylon. So again, as we've gone through this, we've gone through Assyria and Babylon and now Persia. Now sometimes it's called the Medo-Persian or the Median-Persian Empire and that was because it was a combination of the Medes and the Persians. And that's kind of what was meant in several of the prophecies in Daniel. But the one we just read where it said that he would divide it, that was because the Medes and the Persians were kind of two different people groups. Um, it's mostly the area, uh, what we now call Iran. The media being to the north and the northern, kind of what we would call Iraq now. And Persia being towards the south. Uh, I'm sure you've heard of the Persian Gulf, which is the area between Saudi Arabia and Iraq or Iran. And obviously that's where this comes from. We're going to read a couple of prophecies here. Jeremiah 29 verse 10. Um, I was already there when we started here, but if it takes you a little while to find it, you can obviously pause the video. Uh, Jeremiah 29.10 For thus says the Lord, After seventy years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word towards you and cause you to return to this place. So, just like we had said earlier, um, God had prophesied and he told he told the Israelites how long this was going to last. It was going to last 70 years. And that is what happened. Um, the next prophecy I want to read is in Isaiah. Isaiah 44, verse 24. And I'll, I'll go ahead and read that. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, and he who formed you in the womb, I am the Lord who makes all things, who stretches out the heavens all alone, who spreads abroad the earth by myself. And even that verse really makes you think about not only is God in control of all of these great world powers and nations and wars and fighting, but He specifically has made each one of us. And He, and he designed us and created us for purposes that only He knows about. And again, it's something that He has done for all of us. And it's just beyond anything we can really imagine. Uh, but he has also created the earth. It says he has made all things. And let's skip over then to verse 28. Isaiah 44, verse 28 through 40, chapter 45, verse 1. It says, Who says of Cyrus, He is my shepherd, and he shall perform all my pleasure. Saying to Jerusalem, You shall be built, and to the temple your foundation shall be laid. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held, to subdue nations before him and loose the armor of kings, to open before him the double door so that the gates will not be shut. This was written around 150 years before Cyrus the Great. Um, Isaiah was in, this, in the 700 B.C. range. And again, well over 100 years before Cyrus did this, God not only knew why he had created Cyrus, but he knew that Cyrus would be the person who would defeat the Babylonians. And after he defeated them, again, in prophecy, God said that Cyrus would be the one to let the Israelites back to Jerusalem and who will build Jerusalem and, and allow the temple to be built. So, he would not only defeat the Babylonians, but then he would turn around and free the exiles from Babylon. And it's just, to me, a really amazing thing that God even said the name of the man before he ever existed that he would use to do these things. He called him, Here is my shepherd. 
And he says, uh, Cyrus, whose right hand I have held. So it is pretty amazing. And we're going to read more about God, um, I wouldn't necessarily say controlling, but knowing what was going to happen with great leaders way before anyone else did. Uh, before the, obviously before they even happened. So to go along with this, we're going to uh, we're going to talk a little bit about Cyrus the Great. Um, this is not necessarily from the Bible, but from history. Uh, and if if you're looking at the, uh, hopefully Tony has the um, the presentation and not my face up there, but I'm sure the presentation is a lot better to look at. But there's a map on slide two that talks about uh, or that shows what's going on here. Um, so the media is shown in yellow, the Median Empire, and Persia is actually shown to the south in darker green. Babylon, Babylonia, <laughs> Babylon, however you'd like to say it, um, is the area that uh, kind of follows what we talked about weeks and weeks ago, the Fertile Crescent, the Tigris and Euphrates River, um, the Sea of Galilee and the Jordan River and down towards the Red Sea. That was the Babylonian Empire, um, but Babylon also was bigger than that earlier on. Um, but Cyrus the Great, technically he was Cyrus the Second. He was the son of Cambyses the First of Persia and Mandane, who was a Median princess. So his mother was Median and his father was Persian. And Persia at the time was a vassal state of the Medes. That means that Media controlled them, and Persia paid tribute to them. But Cyrus, who, according to his father, was uh, Persian, but obviously his mother was Median, when he came to power for his father, he overthrew his grandfather, who was the king of the Medes in 550 BC. So his mother's father was the king of Media, and that is who he overthrew. And he won several battles, and that's when the the media Persian Empire kind of combined into one. Um, so then he went west, and you can see from the map, he went over the north side of Babylon, and he went into what we call now Turkey. So there's an area in western Turkey today called Lydia, um, and he attacked Lydia, specifically at, at a place called Sardis, in 546 and kind of conquered that area from the Babylons. Um, this really concerned uh, this really concerned the Greeks and the Greeks and the Persians kind of started fighting in that area and that went on for quite some time but it isolated Babylon. It, it kept Babylon from uh, Greece, from the Greeks and there was a lot of fighting going on between these three nations in that area. Um, so, in the meantime, we move back to our story from before uh, of Daniel. So, remember, the, the king of Babylon had kind of left his son Belshazzar in charge. And in 539, and again, I just earlier mentioned the exact date, later on the night of uh, Belshazzar's party... Cyrus and his military came in through the aqueducts in Babylon and sacked Babylon. Uh, so that was in 539, and they killed uh, Belshazzar, from what I understand, that very night. Um, now, what we're going to read about in Ezra here in a second, if you want to start flipping to Ezra, is that Cyrus allowed the Jews to return to Jerusalem and build the temple in 538, the, within a year of when he conquered Babylon. Um, so we're going to talk about that. We're going to flip over to Ezra chapter 1. Um, Ezra is more of a historical book. Ezra is not uh, a prophet. So a lot of the prophets you know, are from, um, from the time of the exile or before. Uh, some of them are from after the exile, though, as well. Um, and we're going to talk about, uh, again, Ezra chapter 1, verse 1 through 4. Then I'm going to read verse 7 through 8 and verse 11. 
Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom, and also put it in writing, saying, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, All the kingdoms of the earth the Lord God of heaven has given me, and he has commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is among you of all his people? May his God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is God, which is in Jerusalem. And whoever is left in any place where he dwells, let the men of his place help him, with silver and gold, with goods and livestock, besides the free will offerings for the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. And we're going to skip over to verse 7. King Cyrus also brought out the articles of the house of the Lord, which Nebuchadnezzar had taken from Jerusalem, and put in the temple of his gods. And Cyrus, the king of Persia, brought them out by the hand of Mithrida, the treasurer, and counted them out to Sheshbazar, the prince of Judah. This is the number of them, 30 gold platters, 1,000 silver platters, 29 knives, 30 gold basins, 410 silver basins of a similar kind, and 1,000 other articles. All the articles of gold and silver were 5,400, and all these Sheshbazar took with the captives who were brought from Babylon to Jerusalem. So, who was Sheshbazar? Again, I'm probably not saying the name right, but we're going to give it a try. Sheshbazar was in the line of David, and he was ultimately a descendant of the king who was extracted out of Jerusalem by Babylon. So, Cyrus and his, uh, his experts knew, and they had heard, um, I don't know at what time, but at some point, they had heard God's prophecies. And Cyrus thought it was a really neat thing. And so he wanted to fulfill them all. And I think that God put that into his heart. You know, God, it wasn't in my mind that God was controlling Cyrus, but God put in Cyrus's heart um, what he wanted him to do. And Cyrus listened. Cyrus followed him. And Cyrus did accept that he was he was the God of, of the Jews and... You know, we don't know how close Cyrus followed followed God, but he did listen to him. And so the, kind of the question here is, what did Cyrus allow to happen? Um, ultimately, Cyrus allowed as many exiles, Jewish exiles, that wanted to go back. He allowed them to go back. He gave them all the articles that Nebuchadnezzar had stolen from the temple. I'm sure some of them that Belshazzar was parting with uh, the night Cyrus entered Babylon. Um, he gave them back and he wanted them to rebuild Jerusalem. So it, it was a great thing and it was answered prophecy. Okay, slide three. We're going to talk more about Persia. Um, although we're moving on from Cyrus, I just want to show this picture. This picture is one that Bethany and I took in France at the Louvre in Paris. And this is actually part of Cyrus's palace at Susa. So this was recovered, I don't know when, but brought back to France. Um, and again, this, this was part of the structure that held up timbers of Cyrus's palace. So these things that are in the Bible, they were real. The, and, and I know we've talked about this several times as we've gone through this, but these are very real stories, and this is exactly what happened. Um, that, the record of history goes right along with what is in the Bible, in the Old Testament and New Testament. Uh, but let's go ahead and talk more about the Persian period. Two kings after Cyrus the Great uh, was Darius the First, and the Bible also talks about him. Uh, what we're going to read is that Haggai and Zechariah prophesy in the in the reign of Darius the First, which was 522 to 486 B.C. and I think, although I have not read those lately, I believe part of what's going on is that the people have started worshiping God in Jerusalem again, but they haven't really built the temple, and they were supposed to. Um, so we're going to read Ezra chapter 5, verse 1 and 2, um, and this was around 520 B.C. Then the prophet Haggai and Zechariah, the son of Iddo, prophets, prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel who was over them. 
So Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltiel, and Jeshua, the son of Josadak, rose up and began to build the house of God which is in Jerusalem. And the prophets of God were with them, helping them. I'm going to go ahead and read uh, a little bit in verse 3. At the same time, Tatanai, the governor of the region beyond the river, and Shethar Boznai and their companions came to them and spoke thus to them. Who has commanded you to build this temple and finish this wall? So these people were, they were kind of neighbors of Jerusalem, but they weren't Jews, and they didn't like Jews, and they kind of liked being able to control the Jews. So there there were people in Jerusalem, and they were worshiping God, but there was not a wall yet, and there was not a temple yet. And so it was easy to control these people. And these two guys that it named, they gave Israel, they gave the Jews a lot of grief in Jerusalem to try to keep them from building the temple. So some of the Jews wrote a letter in the rest of chapter 5. Um, Tatanai wrote a letter to um, King Darius and said, hey, you really shouldn't let these guys build this. And ultimately, Darius looked into it, and he wrote them a letter back. And that's in Ezra chapter 6, and it was this is really interesting. So I'm going to read Ezra chapter 6, verse 1 through 3 or 4. Uh, in fact, I may go on to verse 5. And then we're going to pick up in verse 11 and read 11 and 12. So then King Darius issued a decree, and a search was made in the archives where the treasures were stored in Babylon. And at Akmetha, in the palace that is in the province of Media, a scroll was found. And in it a record was written thus. In the first year of King Cyrus, King Cyrus issued a decree concerning the house of God at Jerusalem. Let the house be rebuilt, the place where they offered sacrifices, and let the foundation of it be firmly laid. Its height sixty cubits, and its width sixty cubits, with three rows of heavy stones and one row of new timber. Let the expenses be paid from the king's treasury. That was the king of Persia's treasury. Also let the gold and silver articles of the house of God, which Nebuchadnezzar took from the temple, which is in Jerusalem, and brought back to Babylon, let them be restored and taken back to the temple, which is in Jerusalem, each to its place, and deposit them in the house of God. Now therefore, Tatanai, governor of the region beyond the river, and Shethar Boznai, and your companions the Persians, who are beyond the river, Keep yourselves far from there. Let the work of this house of God alone, and let the governor of the Jews and the elders of the Jews build this house of God on its site. Um, and he goes on to basically say that actually they need to even help them build. And in verse 11 he says, Also I issued a decree that whoever alters this edict, let a timber be pulled from his own house and erected and let him be hanged on it, and let his house be made a refuse heap because of this. And may the God who causes his name to dwell there destroy any king or people who put their hand to alter it, or to destroy this house of God which is in Jerusalem. I, Darius, issue a decree, and let it be done diligently. So what did Darius decree here? There were several things. But he ultimately upheld, he found what Cyrus had written, um, and he upheld what, what Cyrus the Great had said which not only let the Israelites go back and rebuild the temple, but that Persia would actually pay to build the temple. And then they would give them, which Cyrus had already done, all of the gold articles that Nebuchadnezzar had stolen to put back in the temple. And then he basically said, and those of you that are trying to keep the Jews from doing this, you need to stop, and you actually need to help them. And if you try anything they're basically going to be executed. And it was just a pretty funny way of putting a stop to these outsiders trying to keep the Jews from finishing their temple. So it did put a stop to it, and the Jews shortly finished building a replacement temple in 515 B.C. It was not nearly as nice as the temple that King Solomon built with all of the wealth that God had given him. Uh, but it was a temple that was approximately the same size and that they could worship properly again. Um, as, a, as a side note for history, Darius had continued to fight to invade Greece, and Darius was defeated at the Battle of Marathon in 490 B.C. 
So several years after uh, this issue with the temple, which was actually early in his reign, uh, but again, Darius tried to invade Greece and he, he couldn't actually pull it off. But we're going to talk a little bit more about Persia in the next slide. Music